Ecclesiastes 5, starting in verse 1. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice, and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. If thou seest the oppression of the poor, and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter. For he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Amen. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? The sleep of the laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? All his days also he eateth in darkness, and he hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. But that which, behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor, that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for the word uh, spoken in due time. I pray, God, that there would be someone here that appropriately would receive the word that you had exactly for them. Not according to my study or my foreknowledge or anything, Lord, but because you gave power unto your word. We want to see you do something great today through us and in spite of us. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy and for your word that you have graciously bestowed upon us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 So vanity before God, vanity before God is what I'm talking about. We've talked about all different types of vanity, about vanity of working and laboring, the vanity of <clears throat> knowing creation, the things, <clears throat> the end from the beginning and that sort of thing. Um, but now uh, Solomon brings it to vanity before God. And I think that's what the entirety of chapter 5 is within the context, though I start to kind of lose my understanding of to where it would connect. But I think, Lord willing, we will see connections as we read through this. Uh, the main thing, the main point, the main article that we see is there in verse 1. It says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. Um, my Bible has given the whole chapter, that whole page, Vanity in Divine Service as the title. I've deemed it vanity before God. In other words, vanity in the, in the view of God, in the sight of God, and how that applies to man as they walk in this life and as they work within this life. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 1, at the beginning there, it says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice 
of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. <clears throat> Keeping there, he says, keep thy foot. Well, that means watch over your foot, guard your foot, possess your foot, control your foot when you go into the house of God. <clears throat> It talks about stepping, you know, those steps that we take as we walk with these feet, as we are in conversation, the doings that we go about. The Bible in, in our plain vernacular would be saying, hey, mind yourself, or, or watch it, or, or be careful when you go into the house of God. There's a certain, there's a certain warning that's being given that, that there's something different about how you treat your foot, your walk, your talk, your conversation, your steps as you're about in the world and now drawing it to the, the difference, like I said, of the house of God and how that would be treated. We're to mind ourselves. We're to watch over it. Uh, keep your finger there in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and you can turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to talk a little bit about the house of God and what that is. In Matthew chapter 21, in Matthew chapter 21, we have this. And in verse 12, Matthew chapter 21, and verse 12, it says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. So we see here he's referring to the temple. He says, when you go into the temple, that these things, these money changers, this buying and selling of doves, buying and selling in generally converts my house, which is the temple, which is supposed to be the house of prayer. It converts it to a den of thieves. He's saying don't buy or sell within my house, which is the temple of God, which is the house of prayer. So God here, if you can go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, explicitly says, my house is the temple of God. My house is the house of prayer. And today I would refer that by extension to the house of God being the place of the congregation, the place where the church now assembles. Now I understand that in the New Testament the focus isn't upon the building. There isn't one temple that we all flock to in order to worship, in order to celebrate. But rather, the Bible records that we are the temple of God. In other words, when we congregate, we are the temple of God. Thereby, we can call what we have here the house of God. And we should treat it such. We should treat just as they treated the temple as the house of God. This is why we don't buy or sell things within the context of this house. Because this is the house of God. And Christ, in one of his few that we see ex ex exhibitions of anger and wrath, he places specifically on people that would buy or sell or merchandise within his house. Was in the church of God, which is the pillar and ground of the truth now, not the pillar and the ground of sales, not the pillar and the ground of merchandise. So therefore today, the congregation, the church, is what we're talking about, keeping thy foot when thou goest to. Now, again, there's less focus on the building and more on the people, but we can treat the assembly house the same as they would have treated the temple of God. And I believe that is good and that is right so. So where the teaching and the preaching and the prayer and the fellowship and the assembly takes place would be considered, I believe, the house of God. This is, this is where God comes, yes, and abides within born-again believers through the Spirit of God dwelling within us. But He also, I believe, by extension, considers our assembly to be His house. This is where He abides. This is where He makes His abode. And we're to keep thy foot when we enter into it, when we enter into the place of prayer, teaching, preaching, where all of this is want to be made. Keep thy foot. Be sober. Be mindful. Don't slip. Keep it. Mind yourself. Watch it. Treat it differently than you would when you're walking around, when you're, when you're using your feet other ways, when you're, when you're out marching through the streets or walking to your workplace. You need to keep thy foot distinctly and separately in a special way when thou goest into 
the house of God. You're to treat this place differently than you would your living room, than you would your workplace, than you would a shopping mall, than you would the streets. This house is supposed to be considered a special place unto God, and we're to treat it just as they would the temple of God, His house, the house of prayer. We're not to do certain things that we would in all these other places when we are assembled here. The Bible says in the context here that we're talking about, more specifically, he talks about this. Look in verse, uh, the second portion of verse 1. It says, keep thy foot there when thou goest into the house of God, right? And he says, and be more ready to hear than to give. Be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. So we are there, I believe we can take that portion of scripture out and just pull in the context. God says, when you go to the house of God, be ready, be more ready to hear than to give. Be more ready to hear than to give. What happens when we hear? Well, when we hear, what we are doing is we are considering, right? Because he says here, if you look at it, it says, be more ready to hear, for they consider not that they do evil. So the hearing allows for a consideration to be made of what's being done. This is beyond just a hearing of an auditory sound, of an audible sound. It's, a, it's an harking. It's a listening and an acting out of what's being heard. It's a listening, yes, followed by an action. In other words, the hearing isn't just in one ear and not out another. When you are hearkening, when you are ready to hear, when you are at, at, you're, you're looking for, for an advantage or trying to hear something, it is to the point that it would change something. It would do something. Be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. So then I, get, I guess, I, again, I say this isn't just an auditory thing. We, could, we can't just say that, oh, when you're in the house of God, you just want to hear sounds. No, you want to be ready to hear and to consider, like this group did, that they do evil. Consider that they do evil. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. The Bible records, um, Adam, hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. That's what God said to me. He said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten. Putting these two things together. He heard his wife and it resulted in an action. He heard her say, here, take of this fruit, and whatever that conversation was like. I don't know if she was crying because she had sinned. I don't know if she was enlightened and was emboldened to act and get Adam to take part in that sin. We don't know how that exchange went. But she said something. She spoke. He hearkened unto it and has eaten. So there we see then the hearing is associated also with an action. And here the Bible says that when you enter into the house of God, when you enter into the congregation of the Lord, when you enter into church, when you come here and you assemble to hear the singing, to hear the preaching, to enjoy the fellowship, you need to be more ready to what? To hear, to consider, and to do what is being taught than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Because the group here in verse 1 that offers the sacrifice of fools is not considering the fact that they do evil. They are not retaining that idea that they are doing evil because they're not hearing. So if they don't hear what's being taught, then they can in denial say, well, I'm doing no evil. They don't have to consider that they're doing evil. And here what they do in, in exchange for that is they rather offer a sacrifice than hear the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. Too often you see this play out as this idea of like a Christian karma, a balancing of the scales, where, where you'll see Christians who are, who are not very good Christians, but they will try to give much. They will try to offer sacrifices much, whether it's their time, whether it's their, their, their maybe they're, they're saying, I'm praying for you, brother, or maybe they're just giving. They just have lots of money available, so they give to the church. And they think that their goodnesses and their givings will somehow balance out the fact that they're not living a very good and godly lifestyle. It's like how Christians try to grab hold and balance things, like all these false religions of the world teach, balance out their goods with their evil. The Bible is clear that those that are giving the sacrifice of fools are not considering that they do evil. There, there's no retention in their mind that they're doing evil. They're pushing that away and therefore trying to balance it out by giving more, by sacrificing more, by on the outward show appearing to be more righteous. All those things that are not seen in their lives, they're, they're hiding and pushing away, not considering those things. But if it's an outward show, if they can put on a tie, if they can give lots of money, if they can make that donation that helps the church in such and such a way, if they can uh, pick up people, if they can do all these sort of things that are visible, then they don't have to consider 
that they do evil in the privacy of their own homes or behind the scenes. Verse 2 says this, it says, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. So here he says, don't be rash or hasty to utter things before God. And you can keep your finger there in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and turn to Matthew chapter 5 as well. Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, he talks about this. Jesus talks specifically about swearing of oaths. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 33, the Bible reads this. Matthew 5 and verse 33, the Bible says, Again ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. So this is in Leviticus chapter 19 and Numbers chapter 30. You'll find this statement. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. That's simply, I believe, talking about the hypocrisy of saying, forswearing thyself, and not performing. It says, thou shalt not forswear and but shall perform. So if you're going to swear, perform is what the Old Testament is talking about. But Jesus here, he says, but I say unto you, in verse 34, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea. Nay, nay, for whatsoever is more of these cometh of evil. So here Christ says, hey, don't, don't swear at all. I know in the Old Testament it was taught that, hey, don't forswear thyself, but perform your oaths. It is teaching the hypocrisy and the wickedness of saying you'll do something and not doing it. Saying you will do something and falling short of that. Christ then here exhorts that it is better to swear not at all. Make no oaths at all. In the context of Ecclesiastes chapter 5, it said, Be not rash or hasty to utter things before God. Right, And that's exactly what happens when we swear these great oaths. And when he talks about the specifics of this, you, you know you've heard it all the time where people are like, I swear by the earth. I swear on my mother's grave. I swear on the footstool of earth. I swear on Jerusalem. I swear on the city. I swear on these. And they just throw out these flippant I swears and I made this oath and I, I promise you and all this. And their word becomes nil, becomes nothing. God says, rather, when somebody asks something of you, don't say, I swear on the city I live in that I will do such and such. No, let your communication be this. Let it be yea, yea, and nay, nay. So in the area of dealing with what would be a swearing or a promise or an oath, just say yes or just say no. Let that suffice. Let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. Let your word be good enough. When somebody asks you to do something, have a word that backs it up. When, when, when Josh says yes, that means he's going to do it. He's going to follow through. When Josh says no, that means it isn't going to happen. He's not going to do that thing. And let that be your testimony. Let your communication be this. For whatsoever is more of these cometh of evil. It cometh of harm. In other words, more harm follows and will follow when we make these great exaggerated oaths. Though we do find them often in the scripture, we do find sometimes people will make an oath, but every time you find them doing it, either they were, they were bent and determined on completing it, and they did, and then therefore just as well it was a yes or it was a no. But for most of us, when we make these great promises, we fall short. We're men. We're, we're butt men. And then we often fail in these areas. Too many bold, long, and you can go back to Ecclesiastes 5, too many bold, long, and rash and hasty vows are being uttered, especially within the context of the house of God, within the context of the church building. But I believe within this group, and as our testimony should be as we carry it forth unto the world, it is better for us to say yes and then fail at something and apologize and, and say, look, I meant to and I'm sorry, and have your word be obtained and lifted up because you followed through with the apology because you said you would and failed. It is better to do that than to make some great oath or some boasting, bring the God of heaven into it, and I, I swear by God like people vainly do. I swear by the Lord. I swear on my mother and all these things that people will bring up, and then failing in that, it's better to just not swear at all in such cases. The Bible records that if you're going to swear before the God of heaven, if you're going to make an oath 
before the God of heaven. I believe it's better for us to say, God, yes, I'll do it, and fail and fall short, than to, in defiance, say, yeah, yeah, I'll do that, no problem, and then not do something. It's better to say yes and fail, but best is to say yes and fall through every time. The Bible says this, then, in the second part of chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes, in verse 2, it says, For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. How often do you think we make these great proclamations about how we're going to follow through something on Friday? I'm going to be there, I promise. I swear I'm going to be there. I'm going to do it on Friday. And here's God in heaven knowing, no, you're not. Because God has some things arranged, right? God is in heaven, you're upon earth. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Therefore, let your words be few. Don't get caught up in your own words. Don't get tripped up by your own words. Look at verse 3. It says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. And that's usually when we, when we really show just how foolish we are. It's in situations when we use too much of this and not enough of this. And the fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. But if the person that's talking the most is the biggest fool. Especially in the context of the house of God. It is more, where, it is more ready to, where you're to be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice. And the, the two things I see here that are brought out to the context as areas where Christians fall short on and Christians mess up on is giving the sacrifice instead of hearing and running their mouths instead of hearing. Both of these are brought into the context and saying, don't do these, but rather keep your foot. Be more ready to hear. Be more ready to be instructed. To be more ready to be chastened, to be corrected. Because the fool's voice is presently known. That same fool that sacrifices his sins away. He thinks he'll atone for his own sins by giving or doing the things that appear righteous unto men. That same fool's voice makes those long and hasty and rash utterances before the Lord and is constantly getting tripped up in the own words of his mouth. The fool's voice is known presently in those two areas. And we see that highlighted here. Verse 4 says this, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. So defer not. Don't delay to pay. If you do make a vow before God, get it right, get it straightened as soon as possible. We see, and I've done this, I've circled the fool, the fool, the fool, and then connected these by a line. We see that that same fool that makes the sacrifice is that same fool that has the voice that is always flapping. And it's that same fool that God hath no pleasure in. He is not pleased with the one that is running his mouth and making great oaths of what he's going to do for God. He is not pleased with the one that is offering great sacrifices and yet not being mindful of the evil that they do because they are not ready to hear. Both of these areas require that the person stop their ears and do not hear the words that God has for them. And therefore God has no pleasure in them. He has no pleasure in fools. Well, that's the feelings mutual because the fool is the one that hath no pleasure in God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's the fool that, that says, <clears throat> that treats God as if he's not even there. He says, where is the God of judgment? Where is the God of this? He's acting as if God is not in heaven. He's acting as if God is not above him. He's acting as if he though presently on earth, is somehow above God, as it's shown in the context of the next scriptures. The fool hath lifted himself up and has no regard for God, therefore God has no pleasure in him. Verse 5 says, Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error, Wherefore, shouldest God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities. But fear thou God. So the end of all this, the one I believe that keeps his foot, the one that goes into the house of God with that attitude, is the one that, in verse 7, fears God. It's like the bookend for everything that's going on in the middle. Better is it that you would hear and not just give a sacrifice to cover up as a cloak for your sin. It is better that you would fear 
rather than running your mouth before God and, and vowing things which you ought not. But God here says, hey, suffer not your mouth to cause your flesh to sin, neither say it was an error. The same person that gets caught and tripped up in that error, whereby they have said a great vow, like I vowed to do such and such, the week later when they have not done it, is going to say, it was an error before the messenger. It was an error before the, the other congregation. It was an error. I messed up. I, they're, they're going to try to cover for themselves, and therefore what they receive upon themselves is what God says at the end of verse 6. The person that is doing such things, not keeping their foot, has God angry at their voice, and eventually he will destroy the work of their hands. It's not the right attitude to have when you go into the house of God. And if you are constantly using your giving to cover up for the evil that you are doing, if you are constantly running your mouth and making great boasts of all the works that you are doing and not actually falling through and paying those vows, do not be surprised when God is angry with you and do not be surprised when God destroys the works of your hands. In the multitude, verse 7, of dreams and many words, there is also diverse Vanities, diverse errors, many faults, many follies, many confusions, many problems within the life of the one that lives this way. But we should fear God. So Christians, keep your foot when you go to the house of God. Fear God. This is the bottom line of the whole of it. If, if you're fearing God, if you are keeping your foot, if you are being proper and respectful when you go to the house of God, if you are ready to hear, if you're ready to hear the words of God, ready to have proper fellowship, ready to let your words be few and perhaps let another teach you, ready to grow in the area that God would have you because you are humble enough to just zip it and let that be what comes in as what changes you, not what goes out, which gets you in all sorts of trouble and vanities. If you fear God, then you won't have problems in these areas. But the fool doesn't fear God. So we should enter, I believe, into the sacrifice, into the service of God with a sense of fear and reverence before Him. It's only right, it's only fitting. Why? God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore let your words be few, and just hear Him. Just hearken unto Him. Do what He says. In verse 8, the Bible begins to speak about the idea of like the corruption in government. And I think what he's highlighting here is what was said at the end of verse 2. That heaven is where God abides and you're upon earth. Verse 8 says, If thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. They that's being referred to at the very last word of that verse is those that are oppressing the poor and perverting judgment. Where? In that province. In a province. That's a specific body of land. That's a specific governing area whereby someone oversees that. What he's saying here is that in, in accent, or accentuating and highlighting what's in verse 2, that God is in heaven, now upon earth. He's saying, hey, God sees these things. Don't marvel at these things. Keep yourself diligent to hear. Keep yourself in the fear of God and understand that the other things are going to take account and going to live out themselves. And God has control over these things. For he that is higher than the highest, and who would that be? The Most High, the God of gods, the King of kings, Lord of lords. He that is higher than the highest, regard it. God sees it. It's not a surprise to the Lord that these things are going on, that the oppression, that the poverty of people is, are being, the poor are being treated such, that there's a violent perverting of judgment and justice within that area. There's corruption of government, of course. This is no surprise to he that is higher than the highest. And these that think they are high... Well, they need to learn that lesson too. These that think that they are high have one higher than they. So why are they oppressing? Why are they doing these things? Well, because they are the same as those that sacrifice the sacrifice of fools. They are the same as those that have many words, vowing vows, working diligently to gain, supposing that it was godliness. And they're the same ones that need to be humbled and realize that there is one higher than them all who sees all these things. So of course there's corruption in government. We need to marvel not on these things. Don't dwell. Don't think long. Don't wander upon these things. God knows. God is higher than the highest 
And these that are doing such things are not as big as they think they are. Those that are sacrificing in order to cloak their sin. They're not as big as they think they are. Those that run their mouths and then later try to cover it up saying, Oh, it was just an error that I did not come through with my vow. You need to understand that there is one higher than the highest. There is one greater than they are. And he sees all and knows all and understandeth all. And they need to bring themselves into a place where they're humbled before him. Or else be judged. Or else be destroyed or else have their works destroyed by the anger of a mighty God. Verse 9 says this, Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. And I love how, how God, through Solomon, continues to do this. He continues to make sure that men understand that the playing field is all the same, that we're all on the same level when we stand next to a righteous God. Understandably, there are some that have done great wicked things, their mind being corrupted, whereby they can't get up to the level where God would accept them, understood all that. But for a time, and at a time, there was this equal playing field, and God himself is highlighting this. He says, the profit of the earth, the gain of the earth, is for all. The king himself is served of the field. He goes down to the field and plucks the same corn. He goes down and eats of the same beans. He eats of the same beast that eats these things. We all eat and endeavor to eat the same thing. But then there's the difference here in being that in verse 10, he that loveth silver should not be satisfied with silver. He that loveth abundance with increase, this also is vanity. And we saw a picture of this happen when Egypt fell into that great dearth that Joseph knew about, where they came to the point where the, where the, where the rich and the poor were all in need of one thing to satisfy them, and that was bread. That was grain. That was food to satisfy their very soul. And so they brought all their money, and money faileth. When money faileth, they brought their possessions. And when possessions faileth, they brought of them very self, their own selves, and sold themselves so that they could be satisfied, not with silver, not with abundance of increase, for they sold all that. No, they wanted to be satisfied with the increase, with the profit of the earth, the same that the king needs to be satisfied with. It's the same that the pauper needs to be satisfied. The same as the poor needs to be satisfied with. Therefore, the, the dainties, the ex, express enjoyable things, the silver, the gold, the abundance, and all of those things are nothing when it comes to the basis of needs, and that is that men need food and men need water. He brought it down to this, this equal playing field so that we could understand a few truths. That we need to focus more as a people on the gift than the giver. We need to focus more on the giver who is God, who allows for the plants to grow, who allows for the rain to fall, who allows for the seed to germinate, who allows for us to be satisfied by those things because if we're satisfied by what he didn't give, and that's our works, that's our increase, that's our own labors, we shall not be satisfied with these things. These things are but vain in the life of any man when it comes to the generic and basic needs. Verse 11 says this, When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? It's like that saying, more money, more problems, right? When you have more goods, you have a bigger appetite. When you have more food at the table on Thanksgiving, you eat a lot more, right? Where goods are increased, they are increased that eat them. So as soon as everyone will compare themselves amongst themselves and be like, oh man, that guy in that huge house, he's got so much money, he's so rich, because I'm just in this little apartment. Well, that guy that's living in that million dollar house is looking at the guy with the $10 million house being like, man, that guy's got so much. Look, at it, he's living it up. And it's always this, this arc of, of relativity. It's always this scale of relativity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof save to the beholding of their eyes? What good is your goods? What good is what you have? What good is what you possess? When really it's just there to look upon it. Remember, we talked about how the earth is the profit for us all. And those fields are what sustain us. Those fields are what we need and are satisfied therewith. But how vain is it when you're someone that's satisfied by loving goods? 
silver, abundance of increase, and all of those things that are no good to you, but to the beholding of the eyes when it comes to a situation that is base, that is needful, that is harsh. Behold their goods is what these do. And that's the actual goods that they can look upon. But they also behold themselves. And I see that <clears throat> play out as doing, that's a perception. And though their perception here is that they have much, the laborer I see profits more because he has gained from his own work. Look at that verse 12. It says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Here we see that it would be much better to have the rest which is priceless than the fleeting sleep that the rich experience. The laboring man, I believe, has understood that it is the earth that giveth all, that it is the earth that serveth the same king. And yet the king here is satisfied with silver. The king here is trying to be satisfied with the abundance of his increase. He increases in his goods and he increases in how much he consumes them. He beholds these things with his own eyes. But what good is it when the basest of problems come to fruition, come into his life? The sleep of the laboring man is sweet. What an, another desire, another need that everyone has is good rest. And yet the rich man does not receive that because he is struggling, he is under turmoil, he is not suffered to sleep. The laboring man, though he is trusting in God, he is not worrying, he is not careful over such things. Psalm chapter 127, if you would, keep your finger there in Ecclesiastes 5. Psalm 127 says this, <clears throat> and this was a song of degrees for Solomon that David specifically wrote um, <clears throat> to his son to explain and to teach him. He said, except the Lord built the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrow, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. So except the Lord builds the house, it's vain to build it. Except the Lord gives the increase, your increase is but vanity. You need to, according to this scripture, according to what we're talking about, about God profiting everybody with the goods of this earth. We need to understand that it is God, and we need to recognize that it is God, and acknowledge that it is God that oversees all of these things. And so therefore, when we have that attitude, don't you think that we will step into the house of God, ready to hear what he has provided for us, ready to have a right and godly fear before him? Because our attitude is such that I don't even know what to think. God, give me of your word that I can grow thereby, being ready to hear, so that you're not as the fool, which does and does and does and sacrifices in order to balance out his bad deeds, or who's always running his mouth and trying to appear more religious than other. No, you would come to the house of God with a foot that is kept, secure, ready, prepared to hear what God has for you. And except God does it, it's vanity. Recognize him. Acknowledge him. Hear him. Yeah, the rich may come and have that religious experience and then step into the house of God, which if you're looking at the context of chapter 5, I think you can connect these back and forth. It's the rich man that comes not ready to hear, but to offer the sacrifice of fools, to give, to do, to appear more righteous unto others. It's also the rich that's always boasting of his own deeds and what he promises he will do in such and such a time, in such and such a day. The rich are struggling to recognize self, while our desire and our intent and our best practice is to recognize God, fear Him, come before Him with a humble attitude, come before Him with a humble heart, and just say, God, teach me. Be ready to hear what the Lord has for you, not ready for everyone else to hear what you have to offer the Lord. <clears throat> Jesus said this, He said, A rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And how true is it when you understand that the rich man is quite often just trying to recognize self, just trying to lift up self. It is his works that will provide for what he needs. It is his increase, his silver, his abundance, his goods that are going to sustain him. What more does he need? He has spent his whole life providing for himself. And yet he goes to bed and will not be suffered to sleep for he's awake, wondering, dreaming, thinking, 
worrying about all of the things that he has lined up to provide for himself, to care for himself. Yet the sleep of the laboring man is sweet. He has understanding that the profit of the earth is for all, that we're all on that equal playing field, and that he needs to keep his foot when he goes into the house of God. So because the rich don't hearken, this is why they have so many issues. Even when the rich do perhaps turn to that religious mentality, they're often just vainly giving vows, vainly giving sacrifice, vainly going about the routine in order that they would still profit self, still lift and elevate self. I've seen this in family members who on their, on their deathbed gave all that they had over to the Catholic Church to purchase X amount of uh, hallelujahs and Hail Marys, Hail Marys said over them and different masses performed to, to somehow cut short their, their time in purgatory. And they spent most of their life in that manner. They were sacrificing the sacrifice of fools. They were being rash with their mouth, promising all of these great things in the religious realm and all that they would do and all that they would give. And in the end, it was vain because they died and went to hell because the, the kingdom of God can't be purchased. You can't right. purchase your way into heaven. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't sacrifice your way into heaven. You can't work your way into heaven. You need to, in humility, just believe and receive heaven. Fear God. Trust God. Hear God and do what God says. Amen. We need to hear Him. We need to hear God. Hearken unto God and embrace what He says as something that you are going to act out. Luke chapter 11, verse 28 uh, Jesus addressing the, the, the first Catholic that said, Blessed are the paps that gave thee suck, and just wanted to venerate and to lift up Mary in the sight of God. And Jesus did not stand for it. She says, Blessed are the paps which gave thee suck. And he said, Yay! Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. Right? A, a quick and firm rebuke that, hey, this religious mentality that we're just going to lift up some person, we're just going to venerate some person, we're just going to increase some person is completely wrong. Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word. Blessed are they that keep the word. And what is that? Well, that is being more ready to hear and to fear what God has put before you and acting upon that. Verse 13 says this, it says, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their herd. And how true is this that when these riches are kept and stored and built and, and maintained, that becomes their faith. That becomes what they'll trust in, their big bank. How hardly shall rich enter into the kingdom of God? Well, of course, because if they do come to religion, they're going to do it the same way that they've done everything else. They're going to have a bank that's going to provide their way to heaven. They're going to have their stockhold that's going to bring them what they need in order to sacrifice enough, in order to do enough, in order to be religious and righteous enough. They have their bank, whether it be their money or whether it be their good works. And that's what they're going to present God with. Look at all that I have amassed in my time that I was here. But that is a sore evil compared, uh, according to the Bible. These riches that are kept by the owners thereof to their hurt. How often do we think about something like riches being harmful? Well, they are harmful and they are hurtful because these same riches are the sore evil that is going to bring that rich man to hell because he is relying on it, he is trusting on it, and he has no ability to trust in anything else. He is going to keep those riches as a backup plan for everything, as his motivating factor to grow it. He wants the riches to be ultimately what buys his ticket to heaven. And the Bible, well, a saying that I like to say is the Catholics, they're, they're so wicked because what they do is they sell tickets to heaven that sends someone to hell. Right? They just buy into it and buy into it and buy into it. You have to pay for your first communion. You have to pay for your baptism. You have to pay for this, pay for that. Finally, you're going to pay for all these masses to be sent. And when the person finally is on their deathbed and they get on that bus with their ticket to heaven, that bus makes a firm right turn and goes straight to hell. And that is the Catholic religion. And that is what I believe in, in, a, in a way is being highlighted here. Hey, keep thou foot when thou goest to the house of God. There needs to be a proper reverence and understanding. You need to fear God. You need to trust 
God, because the fool's voice is known by his words. Because those that are rash with their mouth and offering these great sacrifices are those that are rich and those that are foolish and those that are fallen are going to find their way into hell. Verse 14 says this, it says, But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. And I saw that too, where someone was super rich and gave it all to the Catholic Church. And the son that was born after received nothing of it, right? Because they're so bent on using all of their resources at the end. That bank that they had that was to their own hurt. That great riches that they kept in store and their ownership of it in order that they would transfer it over so they could buy their way into heaven it was not reserved for their family. It was reserved completely for themselves. And those riches perished by evil travail. And he begetteth the son, and there is nothing in his hand. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. Job chapter 1 and verse 21, Job realized this. He didn't even have to die to realize this. He basically lost everything that he had, everything that he had acquired, everything that he had known and loved was just ruined from him. All his possessions, his family, his loves, his cares, he lost it all. And at this point, his flesh was still uh, pretty much untouched. Though he, on the outwardly, had lost everything. And Job said this. He said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So whether you have much, or whether you have little today, it is God that gave it you. Whether you have great wealth, or whether you got nothing. No two pennies to rub together. In Canada, pennies don't even exist anymore. But if you're broke... God gave you what you do have. If you're rich, God gave you what you do have. And we need to understand that. Whether you're a king or whether you're a lowly peasant, you are served of the same field that God provideth for, the same field that God groweth. So then why do we labor for wind and sorrows? Why do we labor for something that is vain, for something that when we receive and store up is only going to bring us hurt? Verse 16 says this, And this also is a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? All his days also he eateth in darkness, and he hath much sorrow and wrath in his sickness. This connection is being made that the one who is rich and yet hath nothing, the one who is rich and maybe even religious, but it's vain, he hath nothing but sorrow and wrath, and it's termed as a sickness. It's termed as a disease. To be without God is a sickness. It is a great sorrow. It's great vanity. So what do we do instead of laboring for these types of things? Well, just like the Bible says, hey, hear God, and don't be rash before him, but fear. Hear and fear. Hear him and do what he says. Consider when you do evil. Consider the words that you are about to speak. Consider how you behave yourself in the house of God and where you stand before him, that God is in heaven and thou art upon earth. Consider these things and it will humble you. Hear God and fear him. Put God in his proper place. As he explained in this Bible verse, in verse 8, he said, He that is higher than the highest regardeth. The highest of all, the greatest of all, God Almighty regardeth what's going on in this world. And yet too often we act and behave just as the fool that just wants to ignore God's presence, wants to ignore God's existence, want to pretend he doesn't exist. And even if they do become religious, it's all an outward show of their own selves. Look how good I am. Look how righteous I am. Look how much I gave. Look how much I have boasted. Look how much I can do. I can help these people get on a bus. I can help these people get to church. I can clean up and stay late after church and do such things. And it's all just this fair shrew in the flesh. It's all just these works that they are using to their own hurt because they are using these works. They are using these sacrifices to make a cloak for their sin, not considering that they do evil. When the best thing that they could do would be to hear God. Remember Mary and Martha, right? Martha was cumbered about much business. She was working and laboring and toiling and doing all sorts of things. And Mary was just sitting there at the feet of Jesus, hearing him. And Martha's beef with that was, Lord, she's doing nothing. She's not working. She's not toiling. She's not sacrificing. She's not making these, these great proclamations of all the good works that she's going to do. She's not being religious enough. She's just sitting there and listening to you. And Jesus said, she hath that good part. 
right? What Mary was doing was right, and that was sitting at the feet of the Lord, being ready to hear. Now, we are at the house of God. How great would it be to be at the feet of God and to hear such truths? But we can today, not because I'm some great preacher, but because the Bible is being preached. And the Bible has power in and of itself. Not because of me, but in spite of me, the words of the Lord coming across the pulpit, coming across this sacred desk, can elevate your heart to do right. You can consider that you do evil. You can hear the words and obey them. And this is all that God wants from us. He wants us to hear Him. He wants us to fear them. And the best place to do that, to fear Him and to hear Him, is within the house of God, when the Word of God is being preached. God chose the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. He chose that this would be the vehicle whereby He would communicate His truths to the people. I'm not going to downplay personal Bible reading. I'm not going to downplay listening to sermons at home. But in the house of God is where we need to keep our foot. And not just mind it and watch it and have a certain conversation, but no, keep it there. Plant it there. Stay there best you can, as often as you can. Be in the house of God not to give the sacrifice of fools, not to be an outward show, not to be the best dressed, the best looking, the most religious sounding, saying brother, saying God bless you, hallelujah, and doing all those things that appear outwardly as some sort of sacrifice, as a fool's voice that is known by the multitude of his words. But no, be ready with a righteous, godly fear to hear what God has for you and be prepared for such a thing. Keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of God. Be ready to receive the gift that you wouldn't be looking back upon these days. Look at the verse 18. It says, Behold that which I have seen. It is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joys of his heart. See, too often when people dwell upon where they're living, too often when people dwell upon uh, the increase that they have, the silver that they have, that vain increase, um, they're increasing in good, is because they have that mentality that they're always trying to obtain. They have not slept. They have not rested. And they have all these stories of their life and how they've come through things. But like the Bible says here, he shall not remember the days of his life. Not only because it's but a vapor, but because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. So God here is saying that, hey, enjoying the good that you eat, and the good that you drink, and the good of all your labor that you taketh under the sun, this is what God has given you for your portion. Then he says this, that even those that he has given riches and wealth to, this is a gift of God that you should rejoice in. And for he shall not much remember the days of his life. In other words, once it's past, it's past. We don't need to dwell on those things because God is continually and always answering him in the joy of his heart. And I believe this is how God actually works in our lives. We don't need to dwell on the past. We don't need to be stuck in the past. We don't need to remember the hard times, remember the good times, because our life will be a constant outflowing of the joy in our heart as we simply live with God, let him provide for us, remembering that the king himself is served at the same field. Therefore, we're all on equal playing field. Therefore, when I'm rich, I'm the same as when I'm poor. Therefore, when I have much, I'm the same as when I have nothing. Because every day, the, the gift that God is giving to me is that day itself. It's the joy in my heart. It's the rejoicing of my heart. I know that I will never be satisfied with silver. I know that I will never be satisfied with the love that I have for abundance and increase. But if I am satisfied with just being with God and hearing God, then every day is that rejoicing and joyful and wonderful day. And this is what people that are rich and religious are missing out on. Better to be poor and just hear the word of God. Amen. Better to be rich, hey, and still hear the word of God. But if that leaves you tomorrow, it's the same thing. Hear God. Fear God. Trust God and don't be rash with your mouth. Don't be known as a fool. Don't be known as the one that moves God out of their life and has no relation with God, but rather be the one that's sitting at his feet, has kept his own feet within the house of God and is ready to hear, more ready to hear than 
to offer sacrifices and to do the religious outshow, the religious activity. Fear God, people. And that's where the joy of your heart rests. Recognize that everything that you have is but a gift that he has given, and you'll learn to appreciate one day at a time everything God has provided, everything that he's done for you, and you won't be caught in the trap of just religiosity and in the struggles that the rich person is facing. It's vain. 